Hello and welcome. So we have a super packed room, as you can tell. <laughs> Feel free to come close and get cozy so we don't have to necessarily shout at everyone. We can make this a little bit more personal. Um, I'm Ruthie Serene. Thank you for coming today. We know we have some tough competition with Sono Games next door. We're going to talk about the integration of disaster response and emergency physicians. So all of our panelists today are actually practicing emergency physicians, practicing academics, and active disaster responders. So they're going to really kind of open up the world of how to integrate those lifestyles for you, and then we're gonna have a big section of time for Q&A. Um, so just to kind of introduce everyone to you, our first panelist is Dr. Doug Char. He's an emergency medicine attending and professor of emergency medicine at Washington University in St. Louis. He's the founder and prior program director of the residency there as well. He's been involved in extensive research related to ACS, CHF, and education, and he's also a medical officer for DMAT-1 in Missouri since 2000. Our next panelist will be Dr. Paul Bettinger. He is an emergency medicine attending and associate professor at MGH and Harvard Medical School. He's the director of the Center for Disaster Medicine and the vice chair of preparedness for MGH Hospital. He's the director of the Harvard T. Chan School of Public Health Emergency Preparedness Research and Evaluation and Practice Program. And he's also a medical officer for the DMAT team in Massachusetts One. Our third presenter, Dr. Jerome Lee, is an emergency medicine and critical care attending at MGH. He's also an assistant professor at Harvard Medical School and the medical director of a multidisciplinary ICU and quality director of a surgical critical care team at MGH. He has over 100 publications in emergency and critical care and is also a medical officer in DMATS, Massachusetts One team. Our final presenter is Dr. Hilary Cranmer. Cranmer, sorry. She is a emergency physician at MGH and associate professor at Harvard Medical School and the Harvard T. Chan School of Public Health. She's a director of global disaster response at MGH's Center for Global Health and is an educator working to advance practice standards for humanitarian responders. She's deployed to multiple major, major humanitarian disasters and was awarded the 2015 Institute for International Medicine's Humanitarian Crisis Response Award and the 2000, 2015 Harvard T. Chan School of Public Health Alumni Award of Merit, the highest honor it's annually bestowed. She's a technical advisor on Ebola for the International Medical Corps during the recent Ebola outbreak in West Africa and she was incident commander for her teams deployed in the Philippines for Typhoon Haiyan in 2013, the Nepal earthquake in 2015, and Hurricane Matthew affected Haiti in 2016. And with that, I'd like to open us up to uh, Dr. Char, and this is the agenda we'll go through today. I'm gonna take the liberty of coming off the podium because there's way more of us than there are of you, which is a bad sign. <laughs> So I'm, I'm the hobbyist of the group. So I think when a lot of people think of disaster response, um, they're not sure what that means. And it's actually a wide spectrum of people that, that go out and respond to these events. And so we've got a whole spectrum here from what I consider myself as the hobbyist to our true professionals and something like Dr. Kramer and something in between, which you'll hear about. So, you know, hobby, I, I purposely chose the word hobby because I think a lot of people think, well, oh, hobby, it's just, you know, something you do just for the heck of it. And you really can't just do disaster response. You can't just show up if you haven't thought about it, planned for it. But then there's also the hobbyist that's really sort of the inspired person. Right? We all know that person. There, there's, there's model hobbyists that make model cars, and there's model hobbyists that make these huge, elaborate, you know, working models and things. So I think hobby is really a very broad term, and I think I, that's an appropriate term for what I do. So to, as background, I am the medical director for the Missouri One, now the Midwest One, because we've regionalized, disaster medical team. So as that, I am a part-time intermittent federal employee. And if you can figure out what that is, can you please let me know? So it essentially means I'm a volunteer until I'm not. So when we actively train, and more importantly, when we deploy, we go out as federal employees. And so that, I have all the good of being a federal employee and all the bad of being a federal employee. We are deployable in an asset form similar to sort of a, a National Guard that as a team we deploy. So it's not just me, but when the decision is made to deploy, I go out with a group of individuals up to 35, and we have a set group and a composition, and we have a logistics and support and all those things. Um, we're on call geographically, so I'm in the central part of, this, of the country at, in Missouri and St. Louis, so we're on call for the Midwest region. Um, and as such, we go out and so we're on call on a regular basis. So my boss at least knows ahead of time when I'm likely to be pulled out for a disaster and as such, you know, tries to schedule me accordingly or I try to schedule myself accordingly. 
um, we go out under presidential declaration. So I can't just get in a car and say, gee, that sounds like they really need help in Kansas City and start driving to Kansas City. I have to be deployed to do that. And then finally, we, as I said, we go out with 35-person teams, and so it's not just me. But as a result, think about what it would take to get your 35-person soccer team and all their support and all their equipment and everything else wherever you want to go for that next game. We're a non-surgical asset. There are surgical assets within the system, but most of the teams are non-surgical. The goal is that we will be able to take care of 125 um, low to moderate risk or low to moderate acuity patients. So even though we all sort of, were as you know, emergency medicine professionals, we sort of live for the blood and guts and gore, right? We would rather take a level one trauma or the STEMI than the next sort of throat in the rack. The reality is most of what we do in disasters is lower acuity things. Um, but we have sufficient capability to move up to ACLS. So even if you've got the fast track shift this week or today, you never know when they're going to mistriage someone and put a STEMI in that area. We're operational for up to 72 hours when we hit the ground, and the goal is that we can be active within four hours of arriving on scene. Not fully set up, but that we can start triaging and seeing patients. The good is that we're part of a large federal response, so we don't just come by ourselves. We have support, we have backup, we have logistics, we have equipment and supplies. That's the good. The bad is that we're part of a large federal disaster system, so as I'm from the government, I'm here to help you. Um, as a result, I don't choose where I go. I'm told where our team is going to go. I don't choose my mission. I can say, I think they really need us over here, and I can say, great, but we've been assigned to go over here. And so there's less flexibility, and sometimes that's frustrating for the providers because we're all here to help, and then we're told we have to go sit at the airport and wait for three days until we're assigned someplace. There's non-governmental response as well. You're going to hear more about some of those things. Um, and some of them are phenomenal and do a lot of work, but they are different from the federal response in the sense that the federal response is much more controlled in terms, like I said, where I go, what I do, who I go with. Um, things to keep in mind, as you're going to hear from some of the other speakers, what is the credentialing requirements? What, are the, what is the command and control? Who, who helps you to make sure you're, you're not in harm's way yourself? What are the issues in terms of who decides what mission you're going to do? Um, and then also things like, how do you get there? Are you driving yourself? Are you flying? If you're flying, who's paying for it? Um, and security, right? Where are you going? Are you being put into an unsecured zone where there's a lot of other activity going on, or are you going into a shelter and that there's already local security there that's going to you know, make, take, make sure that you're safe as well? Um, a lot of people wonder whether as a general emergency physician, am I prepared, am I trained to do this? And the answer is, by and large, yes, at least at the federal level. Because as I said, even though we would love to go out and you know, be doing the blood and guts and gore, the reality is most of what we take care of are would be equivalent of yellow patients, a lot of green patients, a lot of med refills, a lot of psychosocial things that we deal with. Often it's sort of urgent care, but every once in a while you have to consider other things like are there hazmats? You know, it's urgent care, but it's urgent care in the middle of an oil spill. What about things like tactical and security? So I spent some time down at you know, Ground Zero after 9-11 and stuff. And that was a very different deployment with different considerations and things. And then finally, in the event that you get put into things like this last group, went, you know, our team went to Haiti. Um, our team went um, down to um, Puerto Rico after the big storms recently. Does that change what you do? Just because you have the skill and knowledge to do something, should you be doing it? What is the standard of care? And are you undermining the bigger picture if you start to go on your own and start doing sort of Rambo medicine, so to speak? Getting involved, there's lots of ways to get involved. Get involved locally, learn about systems, because if you, what you know at the local level, you can expand and use when you're on deployments. So I would involve you to get involved in the committees that exist and the interest groups. Um, you're gonna hear more about that. But also, you can get involved locally in your own medical reserve corps or you know, CERT teams or help with the Red Cross, those things. If you wait for it to come to you, it's not going to come to you. Right? And then finally, educate yourself. There's lots of resources out there. Um, you don't, a lot of these are online. Learn some of the basic things. Most of them are free. Um, but having some basic understanding will, will help you. And then finally, again, I'm the hobbyist. So I always ask myself, what are the challenges that I might be facing that, I, that I'm not typically trained for, that I don't do in my role as a residency director or as a general, as a general emergency medicine? Um, what knowledge gaps do I have? And if I can identify a knowledge gaps, gee, I, I really need to learn more about blast injuries. 
Because while I hope I don't see them, I might, I should, you know, brush up on that. And then finally, what would be different in my day-to-day? -day? So I know what I do on a day-to-day -day basis. What would be, might be different if I'm on deployment? And have I thought about how I would respond to that and what equipment I might want and gear I might want? Right. And then finally, I'm, again, I'm a federal employee. So just because I deploy doesn't mean I get to go out and actually play. So in the hurricanes, um, this in September, this past September, I went down as a medical officer with Midwest One and spent a week sitting in the airport at Dallas-Fort Worth because they didn't assign us anyone. That was really frustrating. Then they sent my team home, but they said, but we need someone to go and act as the IRCT CMO in Austin. So I got shipped off to Austin because I played that role before. And then I thought, great, we're finally closing down Austin. Now all eyes are west at Puerto Rico again and Florida because of Maria. And I thought I was going to go home after two weeks. And they said, actually, we've taken everybody from HQ and sent them downstream from Maria. There's nobody at the SOC in Washington, D.C. We need a senior physician who's had experience. So I got dragged up to Washington, D.C. and spent 10 days at Health and Human Services operating as the night shift op. The good news is the night shift op, they say, this is the red button. You're here for the night. Whatever you do, don't push the red button, OK? So it's an interesting background. You never know what to expect. Um, but again, there are opportunities to serve, and that's what most of us do it for. Thank you, Doug. Paul, you're up. <clears throat> All right. Uh, so thanks, obviously, to uh, Doug. I think each of us has a different take on disaster medicine, uh, and my one is going to be the take on how to make a, an academic career in emergency medicine um, as a domestic responder. I, I think uh, it's definitely possible, uh, a little bit like emergency medicine 30, 40 years ago as a new de newly developing specialty, disaster medicine is sort of in the same boat right now that there are uh, relatively fewer people across the country that take it seriously as an academic study uh, and are publishing in it, but it, it's growing. Uh, there are increasing numbers of fellowships. And uh, the good news, uh, again, a little bit like uh, the arguments 40, 50 years ago that there was not a unique base of evidence for emergency medicine. I think the same has been said previously of disaster medicine. And thankfully, we're proving that wrong just like, uh, again, half century ago we did with, uh, with emergency medicine. So. The thing is, uh, I'm going to build on a lot of this uh, stuff that I'll say will overlap a little bit with what Doug said. Um, there are a lot of ways to get involved in disaster medicine. But if you're going to make it your focus, if it's really going to be what you do with your career, what you're, what you're interested in, um, you kind of have to get involved in uh, most of the phases of disaster response that are up there, which is planning and, and responding. Um, there are four phases of disasters if, when you start to study them for mitigation, planning, response, recovery. You kind of have to be involved in efforts in all, all four phases. But um, to become a disaster academician, you have to go beyond response. Uh, and, and response is, is certainly fantastic. And I, I don't think you can actually be a credible disaster researcher, disaster uh, academician without responding. Uh, you know, you, you can't say you know what you're talking about if you never go into the field, if you don't see disasters. Um, but you have to start doing things outside of it. And a lot of that in, uh, involves planning, so trying to figure out how to make systems ready for disaster, as well as doing research yourself, adding to the knowledge base, and then disseminating it, trying to, to get it out there and publish. Um, if you're going to go into disaster medicine, there really is absolutely fundamental knowledge required. Um, just like you wouldn't call yourself a cardiologist or nephrologist uh, with, without uh, knowing all the, all the basic uh, details. It's maybe not quite that rigorous yet, um, but you have to understand the systems that work. So the incident command system is how uh, organizations organize themselves. The National Incident Management System, NIMS, is how different organizations work together. Um, there's a document called the National Response Framework, uh, which is the federal dogma for how the whole system fits together uh, among different hospitals and public health responders and public safety responders. It weaves together the local, state, and federal levels. You have to understand how that's supposed to work. You have to understand the healthcare uh, and public health uh, preparedness and response cap capabilities. So um, there's something called ASPR, the Assistant Secretary for Preparedness and Response at the federal level within the Department of Health and Human Services. And ASPR is the part of the federal government that oversees uh, health emergency response uh, for the whole country. They have listed a set of capabilities that all health systems should have um, to be able to respond to disaster. Um, you have to know those capabilities. That's sort of the framework around which we structure our conversations uh, for domestic preparedness. 
And then probably lastly, what I really want to say is, is you have to under, actually understand disaster. Um, and one of the things that has plagued the field of disaster medicine is everybody thinks they know disasters, right? It just seems intuitive, it seems obvious. Got to go send a whole bunch of people over here, got to respond, got to set up tents. And the truth is, is that most of what people think they know about disaster is actually wrong. Um, I started doing some version of disaster response in the 80s, uh, mostly through EMS. Uh, and then eventually over the years uh, transitioned into hospital-based, healthcare-based uh, emergency response. Um, and I'll tell you that almost everything that I was taught when I first started doing this in the 1980s was completely wrong, absolutely wrong. Um, and it was made up. It was made up by people who kind of in their mind had the way that they thought a disaster should look, they'd love a disaster to look, that triage works a certain way, or the patient distribution works a certain way, or injury patterns work, work a certain way. I think Doug already very nicely touched on the idea that there's a lot of myths about what patients really look like. Uh, that there's a lot of blood and guts and it's all like trauma resuscitations and, and that's not it. Uh, you know, the greatest morbidity uh, and mortality following many disasters is the interruption to primary care, the lack of access to basic medical care. So you have to understand what the needs really are. You have to understand what are the effective solutions um, for different kinds of disasters. And there's a great article by Eric Aufderheide uh, which, which dispels some of the most common myths in disaster response. Um, but you have to understand that there is an epidemiology to disasters and you have to understand what that looks like because when you're planning, you're not going to create good plans if you really don't understand the, the problem that you're facing. And even as a responder, uh, if you have mis misguided notions about what disasters look like, again, you're not going to be effective in the field and you'll probably be pretty frustrated because there's going to be a big gap between what you think you should be doing and what you actually are doing. Beyond the basic knowledge of what are the systems that we use in this country, um, on the domestic side, Hillary will talk uh, more about the, the international side. Uh, but beyond understanding the systems of how we all work together, how we're supposed to work together, and understanding the epidemiology of what disasters really do, what are the health threats, what's really effective, what's not effective in disaster response, there's a whole lot of specialty knowledge. Uh, and one of the challenges of disaster medicine is actually trying to put some sort of framework on it to describe what it really means. In my context, uh, what, what we describe disaster medicine as is anything that threatens the usual operations of the healthcare sector. So it can be bombs and blasts, but it can be hurricanes, it can be flooding, but it can be power outages. Uh, it can even be IT system outages. So uh, most of you know that we're so dependent on our electronic health records that when they go down, it's almost as bad as losing electricity for the whole hospital. And so the, in some ways, disaster medicine, as some people see it, as I see it, is about trying to preserve healthcare system continuity, effective and safe healthcare, no matter what the threat is that threatens the operations. So if that's true, if, if you believe in that, that really broad scope of disaster medicine, then you need a pretty broad swath of specialty knowledge. So mass casualty response, uh, I think um, we have been learning more and more and more every year, unfortunately, through more and more and more events, what really is needed in effective mass casualty response. And, and I'll just spend a half second about that. For the longest time, we had the dogma of stay outside a mass casualty event, don't go in until you know for sure the scene is safe. Um, then you can go in with your law enforcement colleagues, you can go in and, and finally triage the victims, try and get them to the hospital, take them all in ambulances, do good ALS care. And, and Columbine was probably a great example of how that kind of a posture sa uh, cost lives. That um, because uh, of delays in scene safety, um, a lot of kids bled to death before people went in to go save lives in, in the scene. And more recently with a lot of the active shooter events, some of the other uh, trauma events, we've been much better at identifying who's sick getting them to the hospital, getting them to defend the care so that they stop bleeding because, again, back to the epidemiology of disaster medicine, it's really straightforward. In a mass casualty event, people bleed and they don't care sort of how you think a disaster should go. They're just either going to bleed to death before you get them to a hospital or they're not. And there's a whole evidence base that's been accumulating about how you effectively stop bleeding at the scene, mitigate bleeding with EMS and in the emergency department and do definitive hemorrhage control in the emergency department and in the operating room. So you have to understand mass casualty. You have to understand hazardous materials. Those events are uncommon, but whether it's chem uh, or, or radiation, um, those threats are very significant. Emerging infectious diseases. We obviously saw what happened with uh, Ebola and people's lack of comfort, lack of readiness to respond to uh, the most severe bio threats. How do you evacuate a hospital safely? Um, there is actual morbidity and mortality in some hospital evacuations. You have to plan. You have to know how to do that. And again, there's actually an evidence base and there's some uh, guidance you can create for how to do that. I won't read you the whole list, but these are all the things that you should start studying and, and increasingly the federal government's been getting involved from a regulatory standpoint, so you have to know what's being asked if you're going to get involved at your hospital. 
There are lots of resources online. Um, PHE.gov is the ASPR website, uh, so um, they've got some really nice resources. If you go there frequently, they'll help you. ASPR Tracy is basically their curated library of all the best publications, uh, the best documents out there. So if you're looking to solve a problem for planning for disaster, if you want to learn more about something, go to ASPR Tracy. Uh, it's a phenomenal website. Um, CDC.gov also has a great website, uh, more for the public health, more for the infectious disease challenges, but there's a lot of good information there. FEMA is more on the strict emergency management side, so less healthcare, but a lot about good information on how the systems work together. ASAP actually has some good um, uh, disaster courses that you can take for free. Johns Hopkins Center for Health S uh, Security is one of the other leading programs in the country. They've got some nice resources on their website. And then there's an organization called the National Disaster Life Support Consortium, uh, and they have some basic courses, a little bit like ACLS or ATLS, uh, to help train folks for, for disaster. So if you really want to make a career in disaster medicine, get involved in planning. Um, don't just respond, and I think responding is fantastic. You're going to learn a lot about different ways to, to respond as a professional. But get involved in your local hospital, get involved in your community. Um, you can do it for your emergency department. Just ask your chairman or take it on as you know, saying, okay, well, what would we do if, God forbid, there was a mass shooting, we got 50 patients uh, in the next 15 minutes, um, which is absolutely, unfortunately, possible for almost any emergency department in this country. Uh, get involved with your hospital. Do the same thing. Figure out a hazardous materials plan. Get involved in bio threats planning. Get involved in what happens when power goes out. Uh, start chairing your hospital's emergency management committee. Healthcare coalitions are these newer organizations that bring together lots of hospitals plus EMS plus public health plus emergency management in their communities. Um, and so these coalitions now have a governance structure in most places in the country. You can get involved in the leadership. And physicians that are involved in disaster response are really, really rare. Um, and you can quickly get into a leadership position. You can quickly get into a position where you have actually some, some say in, in what the activities are. You can make a big difference pretty, pretty quickly there. A local emergency planning committee is another entity that has to exist. It was actually exists because of EPA statute for hazardous materials. Um, it's often a way that different emergency responders come together and, and address threats uh, outside of the coalitions. You can get involved with your state health department. Many of them welcome physician involvement in helping plan for disasters, plan for disaster health threats, and there are some great ASAP and SAM committees that you can join as well. Response is really, really important. Jerome and Hillary are going to continue to talk about this, so I don't want to take uh, too much of, of the topic that they'll cover really well. Uh, but I don't think you can be a credible disaster researcher, a credible uh, disaster academician if you're not in the field, if you don't see things yourself firsthand, if you're not part of response. So, you know, hospital-based team, be part of a hazmat team. Some hospitals have hazmat teams. Be part of their bio threats team uh, to respond to uh, highly concerning pathogens. Um, get on different emergency notification systems and listservs. Most state departments, most city health departments have these automated notification systems and they push out information so that you would, can be the principal point of contact. You can be one of the main points of contact for your hospital or for, for your region. Medical Reserve Corps are volunteer organizations run by local health departments uh, that are called up in time of a disaster, usually to do sort of basic low-level care, but, but you can get involved in that because that's a very local activity. National Disaster Medical Systems teams, that's what Dr. Char was talking about. Um, they're a great activity. Uh, Jerome, Dr. Char, myself, we all belong to NDMS teams. It's a great way to get involved with, with federal response. Uh, a different kind of way to get involved with the federal response is something called a USAR team, an urgent urban search and rescue team. Um, for a very long time, it's been hard to get on the DMAT teams, uh, the disaster medical assistance teams. Um, their hiring has been frozen for years, and it just got unfrozen, but it's probably going to fill quickly and then probably freeze again. So if you miss the window, if, if you're interested, apply now, because now is really, really the time you should apply to a federal DMAT team. But if you miss that window, consider applying to a USAR team, because often they have needs for physicians uh, as well. And then Hillary's going to talk a lot about NGOs and EMTs. NGOs, non-governmental organizations that respond to disaster, there's a whole swath, and you want to be part of one that's professional, that's a good and, and helpful disaster responder. There are versions that are, and there are versions that are not. And EMTs, we normally think of emergency medical technicians. Hillary will talk a lot more about this. But this is actually a whole new uh, organization uh, or a, a system sponsored by the World Health Organization for emergency medical teams. Um, so a, a formalization of how you can professionally respond as, as a non-governmental organization. 
These are some of the best journals if you actually get involved academically uh, that are most likely to publish disaster medical research. Uh, so when you start uh, trying to create knowledge, when you start wanting to publish, uh, I would suggest targeting these. There are others uh, that definitely do publish disaster medicine, but these are probably the best uh, of the ones that, that uh, you can find easily. Um, and then, you know, to do your research, uh, the last thing I'll finish with is make sure you actually know the literature. Uh, you know, Dr. Saren uh, and, and some colleagues uh, just completed a research review of what uh, some of the most common, uh, of the best articles of last year in disaster medicine were. And there was sort of an unfortunately concerning undercurrent in several of these articles that many of the articles weren't well referenced. They didn't actually know about very similar articles in similar topics uh, that had uh, findings that were similar to theirs. Um, and so unfortunately, maybe because the disaster literature is spread out so much, um, but, but a lot of people still don't really know what's out there and we're reinventing the wheel a lot. So like anything in academic medicine, be well read, uh, try and keep an eye on the literature, make sure uh, when you're about to launch a project and decide on a research question, really do your homework, do a good literature search, make sure you've tried to find out what's out there. Like all good research, I'm sure you all learned this in medical school or you keep being taught it by colleagues. Um, you know, research the questions that are in front of you. The more you're a responder, the more you're going to get some questions say, boy, this is really a problem. I think we should address X or Y. Or the more you look at the news and the more you read the literature, you're going to say, I see a problem that nobody has yet addressed. Um, it's always easiest to, to research the questions that you're passionate about that are right in front of you. Um, look at how it's going to be helpful. Um, there's a lot of stuff that's published in, in the disaster world that's anecdote uh, that may or may not be helpful to others. Uh, so try and really generate uh, knowledge that you really think will guide response, will improve future outcomes rather than just sort of share your story. Um, be rigorous about it, as I say, unfortunately disaster medicine, because of course you can't conduct randomized controlled <coughs> trials of disaster, um, is, is necessarily retrospective almost always and, and somewhat observational. But, but try and be rigorous because um, you'll notice there's a trend to have lessons learned articles that are published after every single disaster. And those lessons learned look a lot like the lessons learned from the previous disaster, from the previous disaster, from the previous disaster. And again, it's just unfortunately the problem that people don't look back in literature. But when you do generate knowledge, write it up uh, because we do need to expand the knowledge base within disaster medicine and um, we're looking certainly to, to more folks to join the field to, to help uh, create that effort. Turn over to Jerome. So I'm going <clears> to <throat> change course a little bit and talk a little bit more from the hobbyist and responder side and a little bit less about deploying but more about taking care of things at home. Um, so uh, I'm more on the hobbyist side like Doug is and I had no professional disaster medicine fellowship training in any way but I joined the team as a clinician and learned a lot of it sort of in the field with, team, with my DMAT team and also sort of training with the team over time. Um, I have deployed multiple times for different things, anything from hurricanes to smaller events, anything from seven days to one day. And what I noticed was, unfortunately, with the recent Irma, um, I ended up going out for about three weeks. And uh, my wife had to be at home by herself with our, our I think he was two years old at the time. So it was kind of tough for her. And we really had no cell phone access for about a week and a half of it. And so, um, so I didn't really get to communicate with her or anyone at home because of that. And that's one thing you have to consider, right? You might be going out, you might have no access to anything, uh, no access to talking to your family, to your bosses or whatever, to keeping other family members in check too to figure out where they're, what's gonna happen. Um, the other big part about this is also your bosses, right? Uh, you sort of build up your social capital over time with your bosses and, and you, you will end up expending some of this as you deploy. Um, and so I'm in two departments. I'm in the Department of Surgery for my ICU side, and I'm in the Department of Emergency Medicine uh, for my emergency medicine side. I'll say that my EM side is very supportive. Both of them are very supportive at a very high level. <laughs> However, the compensation plans are slightly different, right? We're more salaried on the EM side. Uh, we have a bigger group of 40 physicians with sick call that can sort of cover my shifts. On the other side, though, and I, I'm not sure what you, everyone's uh, sort of revenue models are, but if your revenue model is more RVU based, I'm RVU based on my surgical side. 
And so if I'm not working, I'm not making money, I'm not making my salary, and it's a group practice of seven to six people. I think we have six active folks with seven people in the group. So if you think about it, if I'm not working, one of my partners is working for me, right? And so leaving for three weeks is kind of tough. And leaving for three weeks where I tell them in four hours I'm leaving, someone has to cover my next two weeks of ICU, doesn't work. Um, I probably will not have a job when I come back. <laughs> so, so what I would recommend is always you have to sort of set it up, right? You have to meet with your bosses, meet with everyone, and set up a plan. It's a little extra work. So every time our DMAT team is on call, I actually set up a backup schedule. I call folks. I ask any of all my partners. I sometimes even pull in. So the good part about ICU on my ICU site for my two weeks is that I, do, I can pull in other departments who can sort of cross-cover me. But I do have to pay them back in the end. Um, so it's not sort of like time, the time away has to be paid back on my RVU side or else I'll never make my salary. So just something to think about as you think <coughs> through all this. Um, and then there's always a question about sort of like, is it easier to deploy as an academic physician or as sort of a community physician? And to me, it seems like as an academic physician, it's actually a little easier. We have a lot of academic commitments, but at the same time, we also have more protected time and sort of a bigger base of folks who probably can help cover your shifts. So it's just something to think about as you think about deploying, but uh, just remember that you're going out there to do a good thing, but being too righteous about it can also hurt at home on both the family side and also at the professional side. Hi, everybody. I'm, I'm, I'm the Hillary Cranmer of the group. <laughs> um, and thankfully, the loud music has come down a little bit from Sono Games, so we can uh, hear each other. Um, it's unfortunate that all of us only get a few minutes together. Um, for what all of you are probably looking for, a career's worth of advice here. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about um, uh, the professionalism, uh, which has already been addressed by all of our uh, panelists as well as um, achieving that work-life balance, um, your social capital, um, as well as your citizenship uh, on the job and at home, which I think is tremendously important. Um, and since I'm the, what is it when the batter sweeps up and kind of clean up? I'm the cleanup person, so I get to do a little bit of um, big picture stuff. The good news is that all of you, if you're interested in disaster response or planning, preparedness, mitigation, or putting out fires in your emergency department for life, um, you have job security. So that's the good news. The reason why we have job security is because disasters are on the rise. And how we um, respond to disasters is, is going to be really important here. And I'm going to lean into that professionalism uh, that Paul and everyone else has talked about, whether it's hobby or uh, paying, paid uh, professionalism. Um, and so we know that with um, the disasters that we see every day in the news, um, even this morning hearing about Ebola rearing its ugly head again, um, we also hear about uh, unconventional wars uh, like what's happening in Gaza. We, there's a big ask for being able to respond to these disasters and provide critical clinical support, uh, even if it means uh, maintaining an insulin or hypertensive uh, medication regimen. Um, or it means critical life-saving uh, limb salvage recovery after, in a war zone. All these things are required, but getting you there and then getting you home is really the important part of uh, the mission for all of us. We also know that um, uh, in, in these disasters, um, it is going to be increasingly important uh, when we talk about getting you home um, that you return whole. Um, you can support and you can respond, but this takes a tremendous uh, uh, toll on you. Um, talking about not uh, your wife being at home for three weeks with the kids, um, uh, and my partner as well has uh, definitely held the home front fires burning uh, with the children and the pets and the calling the family and everything else. So it's making sure that uh, you as a professional um, have your work, but you also professionally are taking care of yourself and your family. Um, and this is tremendously important no matter what kind of response you do, whether it's local or international. So um, today we've all talked, we, fortunately we are in one of the newest um, uh, careers in terms of clinical medicine, that's emergency medicine. We call it new, although I, I'm definitely part of the old guard of being in some of the first programs ar across the country. It's wonderful to see all the programs represented, um, and it's really wonderful to see how um, 
uh, we can see how professionals are happening in emergency medicine. And then we see the professionalism of disaster response. So um, we talk about it on the national level, and the United States is one of the most resourceful and expert uh, disaster response systems in the world, and we can take a lot of things in a resource effective way um, with our colleagues all around the world to be able to respond. And our colleagues around the world, um, and the World Health Organization being an example, now have adopted incident command structure, all the things that we've learned about from the fire responses and basic responses that we've done in this country for the last um, 20 to 30 years. So um, the professionalism and becoming a professional responder, regardless of whether you get paid or not, <laughs> Um, is going to be really important. Um, you should have the same standards whether you're a volunteer, this is a hobby, this is um, something that you uh, do for the, in your retirement. Um, yes, those ugly words, good words are happening, um, but professionalism is really important. And, and really, you know, all of us are talking about what you need to become a professional. In emergency medicine, you have the same things. You need the core essential concepts, the basic competencies. And in um, professional, global, and local disaster response, you really have to understand your core humanitarian principles, uh, do no harm. Uh, you have to know what kind of clinical medicine um, you're doing, and oftentimes you're asked to stretch beyond your normal emergency medicine hat, um, maybe participate in C-sections. I know we shouldn't, but sometimes um, uh, that C-section that happens in our emergency department uh, should never happen, but it does, and you have to know how to deal with that. And how to match that balance of what you're trained in uh, to what's expected on the field is really an ethical and challenging environment, and you need to learn about how to deal with that. Also, you have to understand about public health. Several of us have degrees in working relationships with our departments of public health, our schools of public health, but it's how to, how to help 10,000 people instead of along with that one person, that clinical person in front of you. It's also about disaster management. Yes, we love incident command, uh, but not everybody understands it. So how do we uh, apply this in low resource settings and how do we make it work? And then lastly, it's really about leadership. You are rising leaders because um, you understand these acronyms <laughs> that we're um, providing for you, but also how to, how to bring this leadership back to your own department, whether it's in emergency medicine, in surgical intensive care units, in your hospitals, in your healthcare systems, in your cities or in your regions. Um, we also talk about how to, how to make sure that you are, your training is measured. You know, we have all of our, you know, uh, residency re review committees, we have our um, promotion at work, uh, whether you want to be promoted in your medical school, um, how do you measure these things? And then when you actually do your practice of hobby or professional work, that you're mentored, that you shouldn't be a resident going for the first time to a disaster zone and practicing without mentorship. This is really something that we have to make sure that we maintain as professionals. We also have to make sure, well, okay, um, I did do my public health degree, but maybe that was 10 years ago. How do I know that I still have the skills? Well, how do we keep our uh, skills up as a clinician? We have uh, continuing medical education. We have uh, nursing, uh, you know, nursing education credits. We have all these things, but we also have ways that we have to do this for disasters. And especially because the science changes, we have to make sure that we uptick this as we go along. And lastly is personal readiness, which I, I do want to, uh, bring home, and we've all hinted at, is that is that you have to be able to go, you have to be able to come back, and come back well, and if you're not well, um, the rates of PTSD in uh, primary uh, responders is huge. If you're not well, how do you get help? How do you get better? How then can you help others avoid this kind of thing or get help if they should experience it? These are tremendous things that we have to make sure that we can support each other in moving forward. So back to big picture. We know what we need to do when there's a sudden onset disaster, okay? Uh, certainly we can have it in our hospitals when all of a sudden there's a bed crunch, but when we have hurricanes, we know what to do, um, theoretically. And this last hurricane season, all of us um, were tremendously impacted, whether we were d directly responding or our friends and family and countrymen were, and women were affected um, because of this hurricane and still not having power and all the things that goes along with um, this kind of thing. We can predict these uh, expected events and we can pre-position and plan and also think about how we can support the healthcare system that's affected. This ability to provide a professional response to those affected in disasters and uh, crises is exactly what we're here for and we can work with the organizations to coordinate and, and provide effective disaster response in doing so. We know that the burden of disease is tremendous in the hours and days after a disaster. And yes, um, there's a lot of hypertension and diabetes, but there are also things like 
people still having babies um, in disasters that we have to be able to provide emergency obstetric care. And these are things that we have to keep in mind. Um, this graphic is from um, Johan von Schrieb, who's an MSF uh, surgeon uh, based in Sweden who works uh, critically with the uh, World Health Organization Initiative for the Emergency Medical Team Movement. And this is how we then can decide we need people to be on the ground within 72 hours to be able to provide care. And that doesn't necessarily mean they need to be surgeons, but they need to be supporting some surgical capacity, some clinical capacity, et cetera, as directed by the government affected. And this is critical. You cannot just go in without an invitation. You need to be able to do this in a coordinated way. When I was the um, uh, public health director for the American Red Cross after Katrina in Baton Rouge, uh, Louisiana, I had plenty of doctors and nurses that showed up from all over the country um, who are not licensed in the state of um, Louisiana to be able to care for those affected. And those providers that were licensed in the state of Louisiana weren't very happy about all these other doctors and nurses coming um, and taking away RVUs, essentially, but also caring for the community that they work in. So we have to understand these things. We've changed, hopefully, to become professionals and work with the local governments to be able to provide effective care. It's so critical. Um, you've been talking about the national, um, you know, f uh, the FEMA system, and in the, in the rest of the world, it's the UN, the United Nations, who helps try to deliver care, um, health care, as well as essential water, sanitation, hygiene, after a big disaster. And that system is known as the cluster system. Um, you can use that word cluster in many different ways, but um, we looks like this often at these meetings, but it actually is a coordinated way to do this. And to learn about this is part of the professionalism and to learn all about all the actors who are on the ground. Um, you know what it's like to be, or, or you've gone through the drills about what a mass casualty incident. Imagine that on a world level where nobody wears labels um, and how to, how to coordinate and work in that environment. It's critically important to understand the actors involved. And we know that the actors involved are quite uh, interesting. Uh, back in the 70s, there was a few actors, and now today, showing up at um, the health emergency operations centers after a big hurricane, you're going to see a lot of people, uh, kind of like the wires going into that telephone pole. So what are the standards? The standards of uh, how we respond are reflected in something called the Blue Book. This is the, um, the, the guidelines that emergency medical teams should operate. This was created out of um, the Haiti earthquakes in 2010 on how you should respond to disasters, and that is that we're trying to make sure that you are pre-registered, that you are classified as a certain kind of team, like uh, what you would be as a MA1, um, for a fixed structure or a mobile structure in ambulances, or you're actually going to be supporting a hospital that's, that's been devastated um, because of a natural uh, disaster or a flood. You have to understand where you fit in in this routine, and this acronym SALAD that you'll learn through the Blue Book is some, some way to do it, but there's a lot of parallels with what we do with our own federal teams. And the hierarchy and structure of how it works is exactly how you would imagine it working in your own community. You have local health posts regional, uh, bringing you to regional hospitals and your big regional referral hospital. So where do you fit in there? And if you happen to be able to provide dialysis uh, to a, an affected hospital, like for example, uh, Mass General helped support dialysis care in the uh, Princess Margaret Hospital on the island of Dominica after the hurricanes, um, it was really important that we had a specialized group just do dialysis at that time uh, because of that critical need. And we did that with coordination with the World Health Organization. This I hope everyone has memorized, but it's basically the uh, charting of how you would be classified as a type 1, a type 2, a fixed or a mobile or a special, specialized care cell for emergency medical team uh, responding. And most of the NGOs, uh, non-governmental organizations that are working in this space in the Americas are classifying right now to be on part of these teams, just like an MA1 or a team formerly known as IMSERT, which is the International Medical Surgical Response Team, now known as the Trauma Critical Care Team for the federal government. There's your acronym SALAD. Um, but all these things are happening on the world level, and it's really important to understand uh, what's going on. So um, there's volunteerism. Eventually, you may get paid uh, uh, for what you do. But no matter what, make sure that you're safe. Um, after the Ebola crisis, um, well, during the Ebola crisis, we had a lot of people who wanted to help. Um, but uh, 
as a, as a result, lost jobs, got infected, um, and uh, were, severely, uh, were severely injured um, uh, for the Ebola crisis. And I'm not just talking about U.S. citizens. I'm talking about the, the devastated health care providers that suffered um, uh, because of Ebola. You need to know before you go, and you need to know what kind of checklist to go through before you go. I think it's wonderful for you to go, but we want to help you go and return and not make others sick, and I think that's really important. Understand your standards and frameworks. Um, the SPHERE guidelines are uh, from spheroproject.org about how to deliver essential health care, water sanitation, and hygiene. Again, this is learning these professional things are important. Limb salvage uh, surgery in low resource settings. Um, we learned a lot from Haiti. Um, and we learned a lot from mass casualty incidents. Need to understand these uh, guidelines. You also need to understand about the ethics and how to practice and uh, really um, be able to examine it. Uh, if you are doing things um, that you have never done before, um, how do you make those decisions when there's nobody else around you? And how are you supported in these decisions? Um, how do you uh, have standards of practice when you're practicing in a place where there's a decimated healthcare system? All these things are tremendous challenges, and I don't have the answers for them, but there's ways to help you get trained for this. So what's lovely is that all of us have talked about how to get these uh, online trainings, how to uh, get yourself up and ready to be, you know, get another degree after your name. Um, but um, there's some really essential, critical training sites that we encourage all of you to, to visit and to be part of, and certainly to boost your resume should you be applying for jobs in any of the arenas that we have talked about. Um, I did want to say that, um, you know, your, the work-life balance and the professionalism really is like your, your currency, your currency at home, uh, making sure you get your shifts covered, your currency at work, uh, making sure that you're um, on committees and uh, uh, doing shifts for other people. But if you're going to publish, there are guidelines about publication. Uh, Paul and um, our, my other colleagues have talked about where you publish, but how you publish is important. And there's some guidelines about this. Um, and I, uh, I, I direct you to this paper that David Bratt published uh, about 10 years ago. And it's really a lovely way to say, OK, I want to do a case report. I want to do a series. It's really how to do it. It's, it's the toolkit for how to publish in these uh, areas that is uh, a cor correctly citing and doing the research um, like Dr. Saran has done in the past to make sure that your voice is strongly heard and it's not just a, what I did on my disaster deployment summer vacation uh, article which we really disaster tourism medical tourism we have to avoid and make sure that this is actually done in the in the in the way that's professional and supports this kind of uh, lifestyle um, so my last slide is on uh, personal readiness um, I met uh, Rodney in, uh, after the hurricane, um, after the um, earthquake in Haiti, and he was the chief uh, logistics officer for um, the Super Bowl, which had just returned to New Orleans that year. He, he got up and left and said, I'm going to help in Haiti, and showed up at this field hospital, um, which we built after the um, Haiti earthquake. And he said, I said, well, great, thanks. Uh, what do you do? And he's like, I'm the, I do the logistics for the Super Bowl. I'm like, Great, thanks. <laughs> and um, what else can you do? And he goes, I can lift heavy things. I'm like, great, you've got a label. So with a Sharpie and duct tape, we built a field hospital. Um, so his name is Rodney. It says, I lift heavy things, and he was immensely helpful. It's great that he spontaneously deployed to a uh, disaster zone. It's great that he was able to be effective. But really, what's amazing is looking at that smile. You're going to be asked to do amazing things, incredible things, and tough things. Um, be flexible. Um, Keep that smile going. Be patient. Know when you're suffering. Know when you need to take a rest. Um, take care of yourself. All these things are incredibly important in being the professional that you want to be. So um, I've used my time uh, and my many slides quickly, but um, I just want to say uh, thank you, uh, everyone, for coming today. And thank you especially for Redo for uh, getting us together and my colleagues in this uh, voyage forward for how we make professional disaster response and to help those who are immensely suffering, and then how to come home and help others um, help others. Thank you, Hillary. So um, we have time if you have a few questions for our panelists. Any burning thoughts? I know they covered a lot of material very quickly. It's a lot to absorb. Um, yeah.
Yeah, I think really, really great question. Uh, so exactly as you say, the federal government does a pretty good job of making sure at least the security is covered, if not hopefully other safety issues when you're uh, deployed, and they've generally got a, a pretty good medical evac system if, if you do get injured. <coughs> Excuse me. The um, two articles that Hillary put up there on, the, uh, on, on her slides a second ago um, were uh, a pair of articles we, we published to, to address that exact issue. There are a lot of people who are more than willing to send you into a disaster zone. Uh, a lot of non-governmental organizations, sometimes hospital associations, others. And often they do not have any safety and security procedures in place. Um, specifically, we were writing about Ebola. There were a number of non-governmental organizations that were sending people over to West Africa to work in Ebola treatment units, um, and they had no medical evac plan. So that it, if you got sick with any illness, let alone Ebola, um, you really were out of luck. Um, and so um, you have to critically evaluate the organization that you're working with. Just because they're willing to send you does not mean that they're a credible organization or that they belong in a disaster zone. I think one of the biggest areas of risk is that humanitarian aid organizations, people who work overseas in very tough situations but where there's ongoing need, often pivot to disaster response. So when there's a disaster, especially in an area where they are already serving with humanitarian aid, uh, they want to take part in the disaster response. But the logistical needs, the safety, security needs are vastly different when the disaster happens. Um, so I would refer you to the two articles. I'll uh, let Hillary elaborate on this uh, some as well. But um, it's really important that you critically vet the organization that you might go with because um, both your, their provision for your physical safety in terms of what arrangements they make, but also their ability to, to get you back home uh, really, really, really varies. Thank you for uh, critical force protection. Um, Ebola is, is reared its ugly head again, and so we're reminded yet again about what this means. Um, you must make sure that yourself is protected, and what, just because you go with said organization, and I'll put these quotes out there, these air quotes, um, the, the best NGOs in the world, for example, and again, I don't get paid by any of them at the moment, um, uh, Doctors Without Borders, Medicine Sans Frontieres, um, all, of the, all of these organizations have certain standards that we want to make sure that we uh, get to, but there's nothing like making sure that you're asking the questions that an, as an individual of that organization to make sure that you're covered. A medical evacuation for someone who had an infectious disease before Ebola happened was about $25,000. It turned into $250,000 cash in a box to the airplane on the tarmac to be able to evacuate an Ebola patient. Okay, that's a critical huge number. And, so there's, you have to think about the protection, but you also have to think about the money side of things. Team Rubicon um, has, is an organization that is uh, tremendously grown in the last uh, few years, as well as Samaritan's Purse, as well as um, International Medical Corps, directly because of Ebola and because of these large major hurricanes and um, uh, disasters. What's nice is, over the last 10 years, they do actually look at this critically. Um, and the World Health Organization, uh, to be registered as part of this, you have to actually show these kinds of insurances and protection for your staff. Now, a lot of it does become scrambling. For the next biohazard that evolves, <laughs> which it does and has and will, um, you have to kind of, it, a lot of this is going to be newly happening, but if you don't critically examine yourself and your, for, your force protection as well as that organization's before you go, um, you're going it, to, it's only going to be a lose-lose. You have to know what's going on before it happens. We refer to these articles, they're literally a checklist of what to ask. And we worked alongside with many organizations while Ebola was happening with Partners in Health, with Doctors Without Borders, with International Medical Corps, with World Health Organization to say, well, we have to make sure that there's an evacuation plan in place and so this is critically important um, and it's not just medical evac but security evac um, you know and if you get you know you break your foot <laughs> what happens so it's 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 tremendous that you think about this as an individual that you ask your organization that you're volunteering with or being paid for um, that they have the same exact standards that you would okay and then if you don't go because of that that's okay somebody else will but it, you, it, you have to make sure that you're protected Thank you for that question. Great, great question. Um, any other questions from anyone else in the room? We have time for one more, probably. There's no? no? Yeah. There's comment. no question. I'm going to elaborate on one more thing uh, in this answer, which uh, Hillary mentioned previously, and I think is, was embedded in part of what you asked. You must hopefully be asked to go where you're going to go. Um, you, you asked a little bit about the malpractice uh, error alluded to and the licensure issues. 
um, there are a lot of people who go to disasters and don't think about that. And you know, it, it, it's amazing that we can think that we should just go as physicians or, or other people go as professionals and just start practicing on the corner uh, of another country, uh, despite the fact that we're not licensed, privileged, credentialed in, in that country. And of course, you'd end up in jail if you did the same thing coming to the United States and just stood on a street corner and said, I'm a doctor, I'm going to take care of people now. Um, your uh, liability is vastly different um, if you just spontaneously go with an organization as opposed to being invited by the local government within a, within a framework. And so uh, really in any context, uh, Doug talked very nicely about how the federal teams can only go at the invitation of states and locals, um, that, that even at the, within the United States, teams don't go just because they want to go. Um, on the international side, um, that's what's supposed to be true. That's a lot of what this uh, emergency medical team movement is about. Um, the fact that if you go with a certified emergency medical team, your chances of, of having that all arranged properly are much, much higher, but so much better to go with an organization you know has been specifically invited by the local government. Thank you. Um, any final comments from anyone on the panel? Thoughts? No? I, I might have a yeah. final comment. Um, <laughs> you know, we are compelled to help. You, you all are here in this audience, uh, preferably for us instead of Sono Games, so we appreciate it. So you're compelled to be here. Um, and you want to help. And it's our job to help each other, help those that are affected. Um, and there's so many things out there to uh, help you be able to respond that we couldn't possibly cover it in this time, but there's lots of resources. And um, I'm, I'm buoyed by us being here, but it'd be great to um, be able to make this more available um, uh, to all of you uh, in terms of uh, how you might be able to help. If you're volunteering for a church organization, if you find out about a student who's going and volunteering for a church organization, in a very um, desperate place, um, how do you get that student or that um, you know medical student uh, or even high school student the best tools and to be safe? Uh, Paul Farmer uh, put a backpack on and went to Haiti when he was 17. Look what he did now with Partners in Health. So, um, you know, I wouldn't my 17-year-old going to Haiti with a backpack. I'd be a bit scared at the moment, but you know, we figure it out. Uh, people will go and help no matter what. And yes, they may show up and get a plaque, but um, how can we give them the skill set to be able to do so? And when we encounter something like this, um, it's easy to say that's not the way you should do it, but how do we get them involved and, and incorporate them uh, to be able to help others, work with the local practice and the local governance to be able to uh, provide that? Because spontaneous volunteerism does happen, um, and we want to make sure that that person isn't harmed. They may get harmed, many people were. Um, uh, we saw the highest rates of post-traumatic stress disorder after the Haiti earthquake. 80% um, of the responders were under 30 years old um, without any disaster experience. Um, and we saw the highest rates of PTSD in not only the providers, but ob obviously in the population. We have to understand that what we do is not always good. Um, so let's, not, let's do no harm and make sure that we support those um, who are going no matter what level they are in the healthcare system. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much to the panelists, and thank you guys for sticking it out for our presentation.